Great. Well, I think we've given it a minute or so. So hopefully everyone has uh, had an opportunity to join. But um, let's get started. And firstly, I just wanted to say hello and a massive welcome to today's Health Professions Education Programme Information Session. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kate Thomas. I am the Events Officer here at UCL and your chair for this event. And we're, we're just really hoping this session will address those course, uh, course specific questions you might have and will help you to gain an insight into what it is really like to study on one of our master's programmes here at UCL. I'm also really delighted to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Miranda Cromfley, who will provide you with a summary of our fantastic health professions education program. And there'll be a Q&A session uh, for the second part of the event. So please do uh, stay uh, on the call and we'll be able to answer any questions you might have after the presentation. And so just a reminder that this session will be recorded and will be made available following today's event on our website. We're here to respond to any of your questions, so please share those throughout using the Q&A function on Zoom. And uh, now to introduce our speaker, we have Dr. Miranda Cromfley. Miranda is co-director of the Masters in Health Professions Education and division, uh, Divisional Graduate Tutor for Postgraduate Taught Programs at UCL Medical School. She is also one of the postgraduate personal tutors. Her teaching and research focuses on postgraduate teaching and learning to improve the quality of healthcare through facilitating students to become effective leaders of learning in the clinical workplace. She also has an interest in, in educational injustice and fairness in assessment and leads quality assurance and evaluation for the PGME team. Thank you so much, Miranda. Now over to you. Thank you so much, Kate, for that really comprehensive introduction. Uh, it's really lovely to see so many people joining. A uh, big, massive warm welcome. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a little slide presentation for you to introduce you to the MSC HP programme. And then at the end, uh, as Kate said, there'll be an opportunity for questions. And I'll also pop my email address into the chat um, if anyone wants to contact me with any uh, questions that they think of after the event or for anyone watching the recording who thinks of questions and wants to have the chance to ask. Um, just a couple of kind of tech troubleshooting um, points. Uh, if you have any problem hearing me at all, please do just um, raise your hand or post a comment and, and uh, or shout out if you can on mute um, and um, Kate can let me know and I'll take uh, a minute out just to kind of restart my machine and rejoin and see if that helps. Uh, and secondly, if you can't see my slides, uh, let me know. Um, and also, I'm actually very happy for any kind of questions. If anything is really burning for anyone, uh, please do feel free to ask a question um, if you can as we go along. Um, if it's not such a burning question, it can wait till the end. Um, then we'll wait for the questions at the end. So first of all, thinking about UCL, um, a lot of students uh, come to UCL just because of, of the institution itself. Uh, obviously, it has an excellent reputation as an institution, uh, but there are a couple of specific reasons uh, why people might specifically gra gravitate towards uh, the institution itself. Um, so we can see here on the right, there are a lot of quality metrics uh, and uh, high rankings that um, UCL has achieved, in particular with relevance to the MSC Health Professions Education Programme. Um, UCL has been first in the QS World University rankings for education for 10 years running, so it really does have a phenomenal teaching reputation. And the thing that I really love about UCL that balances with this very high academic standard and quality of, of staff is that it actually also has a really progressive uh, institutional culture around inclusivity and diversity. And this goes back uh, to its kind of origins and history. So it was the first university in England to welcome students uh, not uh, conforming to a particular religion or social background, so to be open to students of any religion or social background. Um, the first university in England to welcome women to a university education. Uh, we know that the Royal Free Medical School was the first uh, medical school to, to open places to women, but for university education, it was UCL, which is now, of course, closely affiliated with uh, the Royal Free. 
Uh, and it was also the first uh, university in England to have a fully open access university press. Um, so genuine kind of priority uh, for inclusivity in UCL throughout history and up, up until the current moment. And that's not just kind of reflected in policy. It's kind of very much from my experience uh, on a team reflected in uh, my day-to-day -day practice as an academic and what I see in the university culture around me. So personally, I'm a, I'm a big fan of UCL, so much so that I'm actually doing my own studies at UCL. I'm doing a doctorate in education with uh, the UCL Institute of Education. So um, I've, I've voted with my feet as well. So now thinking about the actual programme. So the programme we're talking about today is a master's programme, and it's a master's programme for those of you who haven't read too much about it yet, uh, those of you who have will know it's a master's programme in health professions education. And what that means is it's an education degree specifically focused on the practice of education. So you as an education practitioner, as an educator, as a clinical educator within the domain of health professions. So it is aimed at any health professional or uh, education professional whose main kind of work is teaching health professionals. Uh, who is closely involved in, in education in their day-to-day -day work. So that's the MSc Health Professions Education. So why choose it? Uh, well, our students uh, particularly like the flexibility and the convenience. So the programme is delivered entirely online uh, and the modules are quite, they're quite varied in terms of the format of how the teaching happens. So some modules are, well, all modules are, are delivered over an eight-week period and there's uh, a variation in terms of how many live sessions you have to be at for each module and how long the live sessions are compared to how much offline work, uh, which needs to be done, which doesn't happen live, which we call asynchronous work. Uh, so it, it's very much kind of suited to your, your kind of convenience in that sense, because we recognise that uh, students on our programme are by and large all very busy healthcare professionals, uh, some in the NHS in the UK, uh, some in other health professional or education environments in the UK, and certainly many students uh, further afield uh, internationally as well, working in other healthcare systems. So the kind of the clinical commitments and their demands on our students really mean that we really strive to kind of um, prioritise flexibility and convenience. Um, even reflected in our engagement and attendance policy, actually, um, because we do record where we can uh, our synchronous sessions um, so that actually, even if you're on a module which is mainly synchronous sessions, if you miss the odd one because you just can't get a day of study leave or 90 minutes of time away from work, if it's a shorter synchronous session, then you're able to kind of watch it later. Uh, so really, really tailored towards convenience and flexibility for busy healthcare staff. Equally in recognition of uh, the busy working lives that people lead and other commitments, you know, beyond working life, for example, family commitments, caring, caring responsibilities, uh, other, other commitments, staff are really, really supportive. So on the whole, myself and Kerry Calvo, who's the other program co-director and all the tutors are all people who've been through challenging periods of study and work themselves and really understand what it's like to juggle lots of things. Um, and that includes the professional services staff who provide the administrative support for the programme as well. So, you know, if people have problems, if students are encountering any challenges or difficulties, um, then the staff are, are very much of a kind of supportive rather than a punitive attitude. And I think that can be quite helpful to know when you're choosing whether or not to go into a learning environment yourself as, as a working adult. And lastly, the choice. Uh, so it's not just the flexibility that we offer in terms of attendance, it's the choice of modules, the choice of topics that we offer. There's actually technically no core modules, although there is one module in, in teaching and learning that we tend to suggest people do, you know, in their first year of study. Um, but uh, if you go on to do a full certificate, a full diploma, or even full master's, which we very much hope you will, um, there is absolute choice in terms of selecting the modules that you feel suit your interests. You will receive guidance from tutors uh, about um, perhaps not taking some of the more advanced modules if that's not suitable for you too early. So there's guidance available and support for you in making your choices. Uh, and you're even able to book a personal tutor meeting with one of us. I'm one of the personal tutors myself, as is Kerry Calvo. And, and there are other personal tutors as well who are uh, programme tutors 
So you're very welcome to book a personal tutor meeting when you start the programme to get some support with choosing. Uh, but the choice is there. So you can very much tailor the course in a sort of pick and mix way around your own interests. Uh, so in terms of the time frame, uh, if you undertake the course in a part time, what we call flexible modular way, which most students do, you have five years to complete the programme. So you will enrol, uh, you will register at the beginning of each year and say, yes, you want to be a student on the programme that year. And then you'll choose whether to take any modules and if so, how many. Uh, what this allows you is the opportunity if, say, you've done three modules in your first year and in second year you have some postgraduate studies qualifications or um, professional kind of uh, new job or something like that, professional demand, you can choose to sort of take a year out and come back uh, to your studies a year later. As long as you decide that in advance and you know what's going to happen, you can kind of plan your time in that way. And it also allows you to take more or less credits in terms and years that are busier or less busier for you. You can also take a year out of work and study on the programme full time, in which case you have a year to do the programme. Uh, as I said, it's fully online. Uh, the sessions are, uh, some of them are synchronous and some of them are asynchronous. So we have live sessions and then kind of self-directed work online. And there's also a big focus on collaborative learning. So most of the synchronous sessions involve small group work and there's a lot of kind of peer activities group work and um, peer feedback activities online. So it's very much an emphasis on collaborative learning. And the other aspect which we think is really important, and we've had feedback from our students over the last few years since we went fully online, that is really important, is the kind of uh, the, the means by which students can connect with each other um, outside of the sort of teaching activities, which often are very much lost on, on online courses. Um, but what we really try and emphasise on this programme is plenty of discussion time in breakout rooms uh, during the course of synchronous sessions. So we try and um, include a bit of a sprinkling of activities which might not take too much time or aren't too demanding that require small group discussion. But we place you in small groups a little bit longer and encourage you to kind of spend time getting to know each other, do icebreakers and kind of share your experiences of being on the programme just so you can start to develop a bit of a um, understanding and relationship with other students uh, and we certainly find that a lot of our students do uh, successfully manage to do networking that way they exchange contact details they form kind of peer support groups um, so that's very much built into the way that we deliver the program you can pretty much uh, complete as many modules as you want uh, so you can come on and just do one 15 credit module if you don't think that you've got the time or you're not necessarily um, sure about master's level study or perhaps for money reasons, you can just do one module or you can plan to do a certificate, a diploma or a master's. And you don't have to know any of this at the start. You can very much build as many modules into your experience as you like per year. Um, so you don't necessarily have to know exactly what you're going to do when you start out. Another way in which it's um, quite flexible. We do have some frameworks, although it's fully flexible and you can just do what we call the generic, which you see in light green here, the generic or general route and come out with an MSc Health Professions Education and completely just choose your modules as you go along. Um, there's also an option for three uh, special interest pathways, leadership, research and in primary care. The assessment one is not yet um, available. So that purple one shouldn't technically be there. Um, and what this does is it gives you guidance. Say you want to come out with an MSc HP brackets leadership. Uh, there's guidance on which modules you must take in order for your MSc to, to be accredited with a leadership specialty. And what this does is it allows you to say, well, I'm interested in leadership. I don't really know what modules I should take. Actually, these, these are the modules we recommend. And you must then do those modules to get the leadership accreditation. But if you change your mind and other modules seem interesting and as you go, you can talk to a personal tutor about it and, and switch things up and do the generic route instead. So it won't affect your outcome in terms of getting a master's. Um, so for the leadership accreditation, the modules we uh, require are approaches to leading change, Leadership for healthcare professionals, strategic leadership and quality improvement. So we have four leadership focused modules for the research accreditation. Uh, we have conducting literature reviews, writing a research proposal, 
qualitative approaches for clinical education and understanding health professions education research, which is a more advanced module uh, compared to these three, which are introductory level modules. And for primary care, uh, we have teaching and learning in health professions education, clinical and educational supervision and introduction to assessment. Uh, assessment's not yet available, as I said. So that's a little bit about uh, whether you kind of choose a generic or um, a special interest pathway, about how many credits you can do and how to build those up from one module all the way through to a master's and the kind of flexibility of, of engaging with the program. So a little bit about the kind of overall program structure, if you like. This next part, uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what it's like to actually learn with us and to be a student on the program. So the kinds of activities that will basically form your learning on the program. Uh, I would say readings is first because the mainstay of master's study is to read uh, relevant um, articles, papers, book chapters, research studies, and so on in the academic literature. And uh, you will be sort of signposted to uh, areas to read. You will be given lectures which synthesize relevant parts of the literature. So this will be done in an accessible way at first. In each module, this gradually builds up uh, until you're able to access readings and understand them in a more self-directed way. Um, but very much starting with very accessible readings and tutor support. But really, readings are the mainstay um, because to engage at, at master's level it really is important to uh, start to kind of find interests in the academic literature and, and delve into the literature to some, sort of understand about the areas that you're interested in um, and build on your understanding of, of what's been looked at already in these areas before asking your own questions. And finally, we very much hope that you'll be able to kind of take all this understanding back to your own practice and perhaps have, you know, a bit of a kind of critical ability to reflect critically on your own practice with all this kind of new knowledge. And that takes reading as well as kind of discussion and teaching. Uh, we use resources uh, with videos embedded into our Moodle page. Uh, Moodle is the virtual learning environment that we give you access to for all your teaching. Where all the module content is held or via external links. Um, you'll discuss uh, with tutors and other students, either during synchronous sessions in small groups or uh, on written discussion forum where you post uh, your ideas. Uh, you'll get feedback from tutors, but you'll also get uh, be encouraged to do um, exercises um, with kind of involving peer feedback. Um, and as well as discussion forums, some of the modules involve collaborating to create a shared document using pair or group work. And as I mentioned before, we also have live online sessions. So a real variety of ways of learning on your modules. Time is a big issue. Um, so it's really important when embarking on this, this master's programme to ensure that within all your other work and personal commitments, you can actually carve out and anticipate carving out and plan to take enough time for your studies. Uh, it's not usually enough for students to say okay well I'm working kind of full-time you know however 40 however many hours a week and then I'll just do a bit on a weekend before I then have to deal with my family commitments um it's really important to kind of look at your kind of work timetable and see where you can actually carve out some time and for a 15 credit module which most of our modules are uh, over eight weeks uh you're expected to study half to one day per week depending on uh, the workload of the week. And that can be more when you're coming up to assignment writing time. Um, for the dissertation and report, um, it's a bit different because that's spread out over the whole academic year. And this is the one thing that's, I think, really helpful for people deciding, is now the right time for me to be signing up for a master's? Because actually, if you're entering a life phase, which is going to be a big demanding change in your career or a lot of kind of personal demands that will pretty much take up all your spare time, then actually it might be a bit trickier and you might want to say, well, I'm going to wait until there's a time in my life that I'm going to be able to make the most of it. Um, but, you know, again, we're really happy to kind of support with conversations about that kind of thing. So it's exactly this kind of thing that can actually be quite hard to decide on your own. Um, so I'm very much uh, happy to talk to anyone who's potentially thinking of applying who isn't quite sure about that. Um, and that's that's exactly the kind of thing we can advise on all.
um, perhaps uh, have a supportive conversation so that you can kind of come to your own conclusion about that. So assessment, um, all of our modules are, uh, the credits for each module are awarded uh, via an assessment at the end of the module. So for many of the modules, these are written assignments uh, where you'll have to write an essay um, of varying length, depending on the size of the module. Um, but for some of the modules, we have other formats of assessment. So it might be a written assessment that's uh, a little bit more practically focused, like writing a um, an editorial or review or something like that, that sort of style of writing, um, not getting it published just as an exercise. And you'll have support from the tutors about the kind of structure and the writing approach for that. And some of our modules have video presentations as well, rather than the written assignment. Um, so we are in response to student feedback, we are trying to vary the assessment types to make them suitable for people um, with different strengths um, and also to make them authentic to the kind of skills people are going to need in their workplace when they are uh, a master's qualified clinical educator. Uh, we also have uh, in preparation for that, um, we have formative exercises. So sort of teaching opportunities where you're asked to submit work that's not graded or anything like that, but you get feedback from tutors. So for lots of formative opportunities on the, on the modules as well. Support is often needed for students going through all of this. That's so really important for me to say what's available to you. Um, so on the programme, myself and Kerry and certain other tutors are personal academic tutors. Uh, you can book in with us anytime you feel like you need a supportive discussion or if you encounter a challenge um, that you'd like some help with. Uh, in terms of support for your writing and developing your academic writing skills, UCL has an academic communication centre, which is really accessible and really fantastic and really proactive in offering workshops, one to one sessions, resources uh, to support you develop your writing as you go through your programme. So that's a really actually a really important part of your studies. There's also a student support and wellbeing team, which offers uh, all sorts of things ranging from resources on its website to conversations around um, how to get reasonable adjustments for disabilities and health conditions uh, during your studies. Uh, and there's even counselling services available as well. So the student support and wellbeing team at UCL is, is really proactive and very much present and there and, and available for support where needed. And there's also the Ask UCL app for day-to-day -day kind of logistics questions. Um, we really do encourage students to get involved uh, in decisions about running the program. Uh, this is all the way through from us kind of creating organic opportunities to collect student feedback informally uh, during sessions, um, delivering surveys um, during the course of modules to see how things are going and see what we can tweak for students. But also there's uh, opportunities for you to get personally involved via being student reps. Um, so as a student rep, you'd actually meet with academic staff three times a year uh, to discuss how things are going on the programme for you and your cohort of students, your peers, uh, and also get involved in quality improvement, quality assurance projects around um, higher education and health professions education. Um, personally, I lead a few projects at the moment, um, looking at AI and assessment and um, equality and equity and inclusivity on the programmes. So there's all sorts of opportunities to get involved. Um, but we, we do take these kind of... Um, opportunities for students to evolve very seriously and the feedback's really important to us. So these are some of the things that we've actually changed on the programme in response to student feedback. So we we rely on it because, you know, although we are all used to kind of studying ourselves, we don't know what it's like to be in your shoes right now as students. So we really rely on understanding students' experience to kind of improve um, the way we deliver the programme. Um, so finally, uh, thinking about why you might want to actually enrol for a master's in health professions education, where could it take you? So our students, uh, past students, alumni who have completed the programme, have gone on to do all sorts of roles um, within their clinical teaching. Uh, we've got students who've been more confident to become clinical or educational supervisors or take on formal roles, uh, preceptorship, mentorship, becoming practice development nurse. Uh, formal education leadership roles uh, within trusts or within deaneries, um, such as simulation lead, trust education lead, curriculum lead. Um, 
and university roles. Um, so actually, people, once you've got a master's, that opens up an opportunity for you to apply for teaching academic or research academic roles in universities, um, such as tutors or lecturers. Um, and you can actually then go on and do doctoral studies as well, if you wish. We also offer support for you to get there uh, once you're a student on our program. So we offer you support to sort of think about why you're doing the masters, what it might help you with in terms of your career and how you can draw on your studies in the masters concurrently with doing the masters to develop your career. So you don't have to wait till the end uh, until it's on your CV and um, it's just kind of points on your CV for applying for jobs. It's very much about using your studies as you go, using your engagement with the literature to reflect on your practice and gather expertise as you go and use that expertise to um, advance your career. Um, so there's a couple of ways that we do that. The first two squares, so you can request a dedicated career coaching appointment with a personal academic tutor. So myself and Kerry Calvo offer those. Um, and that will give you some opportunity to reflect on the programme and for you, where it can take you in relation to your kind of career and the opportunities around you. And we also offer termly uh, evening seminars focused on careers in health professions education, which are a little bit like this, where you have kind of panel discussions um, uh, or, 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 or presentations from people experienced um, in kind of careers in health professions education and the opportunity to have a Q&A afterwards. And uh, they're also a nice opportunity to meet people. Um, and the third thing we do is to help you develop your academic work and its potential to help you advance your career is we can give you feedback on how to disseminate your work. Um, so for every summative assessment at the end of every module, you have to complete a cover sheet, which allows you to ask the marker any questions you'd like feedback on around your work. Uh, and you can use that to ask for feedback about how to disseminate your work or what this what dissemination kind of channel this work might be useful for. So that's how we support you to kind of uh, use, um, use the masters to get on in your career in health professions education. And then finally, I've got a couple of testimonials here from, from students that kind of support all the claims that I've just made <laughs> about the programme being supportive and encouraging you to critically reflect on your practice. Um, so you can see here, um, this person said, applying to the MSc programme was a no brainer. Um, there's a team of dedicated and experienced tutors who feel truly invested in your personal development and long-term goals. Um, and this is providing me with unparalleled opportunity to cement my understanding and challenge the status quo. So this person actually went on to their own workplace and was able to kind of be a disruptive influence in their workplace with the legitimacy of the masters behind them and with the insight from all the kind of academic engagement they've done. The diversity of a student cohort in terms of clinical background and experience has been a real plus point uh, so you really feel like you're benefiting from genuine multi-professional learning experience. So that's, that's um, you know, really lovely, obviously, for us to read and reassuring that all the things that we're trying to do on the programme are actually coming across. And then this is another person talking about how the programme gave me more confidence um, in their in their teaching. Uh, my teaching abilities have been elevated, allowing me to connect with learners on a deep, deeper level um, and achieve more impactful teaching, which, again, is really, really satisfying for us. Um, and she says the structure of the program made it possible to strike a balance without compromising the quality of learning, which is really what we aim for with the kind of flexibility uh, options for the, the program. And then a little bit about the lecturers. Uh, and lastly, we are accredited by a leadership body, the Faculty of Medical Education Leadership, uh, Medical Leadership Management and Association of Medical Educators. So students exiting the programme are able to apply for fellowships of these institutions um, with a very much abbreviated application route compared to had you not done the programme. Uh, this is the email address for our administrative team, but I'll also pop my own email address in the chat because I'm very helpful for people to approach with any questions. And I will leave it there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Miranda. And um that was just such a very enriching um session. And I hope everyone here hopefully 
it answered uh, perhaps some of the questions they may already have. But um, obviously, we're on to the second part of the event now where we will go into those questions that you have. And um, I can actually see that we have a couple of questions already, which is fantastic. So I will um, read those out. But please do pop your questions, any questions in the Q&A function. Uh, we have got plenty of time to answer those. So um, yes, I'll make a start. So the first question I can see is, as the course is 100% uh, online, are students on this course still able to access UCL facilities, e.g. libraries in person, if they wish? Very much so. Actually, we active encourage, actively encourage it. Um, so we have a really excellent uh, university uh, campus uh, in, in Bloomsbury in central London. Um, students, all students on the programme are eligible to apply for a student ID badge, uh, which gives them access to the libraries. And we can recommend as a couple of particularly relevant libraries to our programme, so the Cruciform Library and the um, Institute of Education Library. We don't have as core texts on our modules um, any kind of books or journals that are only available in print in the library, but certainly as a space to kind of go and study that's fully available to you. There's also a really nice um, UCL Student Centre, which is brand new. Um, and um, I think a few other kind of uh, resources on campus. I don't know, Kate, if there's anything you can say about university campus. Yeah, like we strongly encourage you to obviously come along and uh, join us on campus as well. So um, yeah, we've got a, lot, a range of uh, facilities available for you. I know that Miranda touched upon um, our student support and wellbeing services that are available also on campus. Uh, the student centre is accessible for 24 hours um, every day of the week. So you're more than welcome, obviously, to use those facilities. We have a, a huge amount of libraries on, across campus and also in our Stratford campus uh, you can have access to as well. So yeah, there's... Um, Lots of facilities available. Obviously, I would just strongly recommend that you take a look at our website. And if you do want to see um, all the kind of different facilities available on campus, do take a look. And uh, yeah, please, more than welcome to come along. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this the UCL campus is very much for everybody who studies at UCL, no matter the, the kind of format of their course. And the other thing is that I think there's a few kind of perks and things available you can apply for an NUS card is that right Kate um, yeah so as a, a full student kind of there's lots of perks so if you if you are looking for discounts or anything like that you can sign up for various discount cards as well where you can get um discounted membership for um for various different uh, eateries or uh, different kind of memberships uh, that we have links with at UCL. So you can have, um, yeah, there's a lot of lot of uh, doors opening if you uh, join us at UCL. Okay, shall I go on to the next question? So we have um, another question that's come in. That says, why are the um, why are the online programs always also requested IELTS? Oh, that's a really good question, and that is uh, because of our responsibility uh, when we're selecting students and admitting students on the program. We feel a real strong sense of responsibility to make sure that those students stand a good chance of passing the assessments and coming out with a master's or a certificate or a diploma or the, the 15 credits for the module that you've chosen. Um, because the assessments are uh, either, uh, whether they're written assessments or video presentations, you know, verbal assessments, they require students to be able to communicate in English enough to make the meaning of the academic arguments that they're making understood. And that's why we have a basic English language requirement. Fantastic. Thank you, Miranda. I was also just getting the link to uh, just a full range of the facilities that are available to um, students at UCL. So I'll, I'll pop that in the chat um, because obviously also as well, off the top of my head, we have a lot of museums on campus too, that if um, anyone's interested in going along to those and different um, different facilities available. So I'll drop that in the chat, but I will move on to the next question 
which is, um, can I please ask that, uh, does the course offer you the option of education in whichever capacity as well as leadership or otherwise depending on the pathway selected? Yeah, there's complete flexibility uh, for you to develop your interests and your skills and your writing um, as an educator in whichever capacity uh, your work as an educator involves uh, or your interest as an educator involves. You can choose to do special interest pathways in primary care or leadership or research, but actually most of our students choose not to because they want the freedom to develop whatever kind of comes to them as they go through the modules. Some of the module assignments are very much uh, uh, kind of geared towards allowing you to make much more flexible choices in terms of what you write about. So many of the modules you can actually, with the support of the module tutor, you can actually pick your own uh, assignment title. So focus your interest um, in whatever area suits you. Um, so yeah, it is very much person-centered about whatever kind of you, your development needs are as an educator. I hope that helps. But the only caveat is it is focused around health professions education. Perfect. Thank you. And oh, we've just got a lovely comment from Emma saying that um, the, the session was amazing and thank you. And that she went to a campus tour today and everything looked amazing. So that's that's really lovely to hear. Thank you, Emma, for that comment. Um, the next question we have is uh, from Hayley, which is which modules are the most popular or useful to newbies? Um, I think the most, I would say as a tutor, the most useful module for newbies is um, teaching and learning in health professions education because it's very practically focused and it has a lot of very accessible introductory ways of encouraging you to kind of engage with all that kind of academic literature. Um, it's really engaging in, in the way that the kind of modules laid out and the way that teaching is conducted. And the other thing is a lot of students do it as their first module or certainly in their first term. So you've got that feeling of being amongst other people who are very new to master's study. Uh, so that kind of gives you a bit of uh, extra confidence when, when you're kind of new to stuff and, and other people might be a bit more experienced. So I really, really recommend that one as a first choice. So that was teaching and learning in health professions education or TLHPE. And it actually runs twice a year. Um, I can hopefully put a link to the timetable in the chat for anyone who's interested in kind of browsing the modules and seeing what's available and working out what they might choose. Great. Oh, and Hayley says thank you. Thanks, Hayley. <laughs> thank you for the great question. And yeah, that's good. Our, that's a really good question. <laughs> our next question is um so uh, I have a question on the PGME timetable for 2024 to 2025. Uh says to take introduction to assessment, does the start and end dates uh, are the study day two? Um I'm trying to think. So I have a question on the PGME timetable. How to introduction to assessment does the start and end dates? Just oh, trying to think answer. if um just to make sure we have the we can give no, the right I answer. See what you mean. Yes, I think um you're asking whether the start date and end date also have uh, days of synchronous study where you have to be present. And no, they don't. So the only days where you have to be available online uh, for synchronous study are the ones um, in the column uh, which has the teaching dates um, in them. So I'm um, just getting the, the timetable up on my screen now. So for introduction to assessment, uh, the start date is Monday the 30th of September and the end date is Friday the 29th of September. For this module, the start day does happen to be a teaching day because you can see in the third column from the right, the first teaching day says Monday 30th September 24, 10 to 11.30 a.m. So because it's in that column, there is a teaching day there. The end date of the module is Friday the 29th of November, but that's not a teaching day because it doesn't appear in any of the virtual synchronous days columns, if that makes sense. So the start and end dates are just basically um, the starts of the teaching weeks. Uh, because don't forget, there's lots of online teaching um, on um, 
the web page, which we call Moodle. Uh, lots of access, exercises and resources and things for you to look at. And those become available to you or on or just before actually the start date. Um, they're available to you after the module's finished as well, but those are just a rough guide of the kind of teaching periods. Um, if you want to see on the module timetable, and for those of you who haven't seen it yet, I've actually just posted a link to it in the chat. If you want to know which days you're going to be required to be live to attend teaching online, it's the third and fourth columns from the right. So the two columns entitled virtual slash synchronous days where you'll usually have teaching from, for example, 10 to four with breaks, uh, or um, some of the teaching is half days on those. Um, and then you have like one hour to 90 minute tutorials, and those are listed in the virtual slash synchronous tutorials columns. So those are the two columns that you need to look at to get the dates for your diary, if that makes sense. The start and end dates of the modules are also quite useful though, because say for example, you've got a big chunk of really demanding work where, for example, you might be doing uh, a week of night shifts or you might be away on holiday. If you've got periods like that during um, the eight week period between the start and end date, you will need to think about how you can make time in the weeks before or after to kind of make up for the study that you've lost during that week. Um, so that's kind of what the start date and end dates are useful for. I hope that answers the question. Perfect, thanks Miranda. And our next question is um, asking about what is the usual makeup of the cohort? So FYs, consultants, AHPs, um, appreciate the appreciate this might vary year on year. So, Yeah, it does vary year on year, but I would say it's quite a breadth of people from different disciplines. Um, we have we do have a lot of nurses and a lot of doctors and a lot of allied health professionals. And we also have professionals, uh, healthcare professionals from other groups, um, such as clinical scientists, ODPs, um, dentists, dental hygienists, you know, kind of you name it. We get people from that discipline on the back on the course, um, but it is very varied in terms of discipline. And then in terms of seniority, it's also really varied. Um, so you get a lot of people at the start of their career, because I think, you know, if people are interested in education, uh, from early on, they're often very keen to kind of get a qualification before they start teaching. Um, and we actually get more senior people as well who perhaps have taken on an education role, a formal role as, you know, a training programme director or a preceptorship lead or something like that, or an education lead for a trust and feel that they would like to get a master's qualification to help them engage with that sort of education subject area in more depth. And they'll come on the programme. So it can be a really, really broad uh, mixed group. Um, I guess that's, yeah, that, I guess the only guarantee is that it will be fairly mixed. Which is great because everyone gets to meet, um, well, have peers that are from all different walks of life in different areas of the profession as well, which I guess you learn a lot from each other just from from being there and being part of the programme. So um, fantastic. So the next question we have is... Um, so if we're not able to apply for the upcoming September 2024 cohort, is there another cohort before September 2025? Yes, there's a January 2025 cohort, which is actually really popular uh, among our students as well. Um, I think the application window for that, so well, the application window details are available on the prospectus webpage. Um, I don't want to give you information in case I say the wrong information and then that that kind of sends you down the wrong path. So I think it's best just to have a look at the prospectus web page. But yes, there's a January application uh, intake. And I think um, the, the application window extends up until a couple of months before that. But maybe we can pop the, the link to that uh, before the end of the session so that you have it. Yep, I can pop the link in now, actually. So I've oh, got it here. Wonderful. And then our next question is, uh, can you please give some insight into the fees and if there are any flexibility around paying of fees? Yes, the fees, again, I don't want to give you numbers in case I give you the wrong thing, but the fees information is also all there on the prospectus page. I don't know if whilst I'm kind of answering the next part of the question, Kate, if you're able to pop that um, link as well. Um, I think, uh, well, the fees department would be the first port of call in terms of talking about how fees are paid. So 
as a department, we don't really have much uh, control or kind of input into that. And that tends to be discussed with, with the fees team. Um, and we've got their email address as well, so we can give you that. Um, to my understanding, there is some flexibility. Certainly, for example, you only pay per module that you do. So it's not the case where you have to pay for a whole master's in advance or anything like that. Um, and secondly, I certainly have um, supported tutors, students in personal tutor meetings who have paid fees by instalments. Um, so I know that that's possible. I'm not sure if that has to come through a special dispensation or extenuating circumstances, but certainly it, it happens. Um, so I think the specifics of what the flexibility is would be something that if you're if that's quite key for you in terms of before applying, I would email the fees team and ask them your questions and they can tell you exactly what the structures are and the arrangements are around that. Yeah, and I'm just going to also drop in a link, Miranda, so um, just to the, the kind of fees okay. and funding page that we have available here at UCL. Thank you, that's really helpful. And there is, there is also a hardship fund um, for students um, who experience financial hardship but still want to apply. Um, however, I think for a lot of our students, they are working healthcare professionals. And whilst that doesn't preclude people from experiencing financial hardship, it does affect their eligibility for the actual hardship fund. Um, for, so for people who are working, um, but again, still, still something to inquire about. Um, so I'm just getting the email for the fees. In fact, I think the email for the fees team is probably on that uh, web page. Um, but well, I'll try and get hold of it before um, the end of the session, so you can have that too. I think it's the best thing to do is just email them and ask your actual questions, and then you can get a response that's tailored to your own needs. Definitely. And that page does have all the information of how to contact them directly as well. So um, please do take a look if that's something that you are concerned about. Obviously, um, that is probably the best point of call. And I think I'm really glad someone's asked that question because it's really important. It is expensive to do uh, any master's study, whether it's a module or a, or a whole master's. Um, and I think, you know, fees are a really, really crucial consideration for a lot of people. So um, I think I'm sure you won't be the only person who's interested in the answer to that question that you've asked. Fantastic. Um, so at the moment, we've just got lots lots of lovely comments back saying thank you so much, Miranda, for clearing um, obviously some of those queries that uh, some of us on the call had today. So that's great. Um, but yeah, please do send us any more questions. Um, we are still here, so um, maybe at the moment I will I will fill in some of the gaps as you have a little bit of time to think about those final questions. But um, I'm just really interested in uh, what does your kind of ideal applicant on this course uh, look like to you, Miranda? Like, what what would their um, could you tell us a bit about perhaps the students that are already there? or who, who you're really trying to attract on this course, um, that would be sure. yeah, really interesting to find out. We're really trying to attract people with an interest in education um, in the domain of health professions. So uh, this programme is very much not about um, learning about clinical things like you know the practice of medicine, surgery, intensive care, uh, anything like that. It really much is only a course about education. Uh, it's all sorts of matters in education. It can be leadership, um, it can be teaching skills, it can be research, it can be evaluation, it can be assessment. Uh, you might be interested in sort of contentious contemporary issues in, in education. Um, or as I said, it might be about teaching skills and you might be very much wanting to just focus on your own practical kind of skill development in, in terms of being a more impactful teacher. But it is people with an interest in education and developing their own kind of interest in education that we're primarily wishing to appeal to. That can be um, definitely we're really keen uh, for students from backgrounds where they haven't necessarily done postgraduate study recently. Um, so obviously, although we have entry criteria about having had to have got a, an undergraduate degree, that can have been years ago. And it might be that academic study wasn't the thing you're most confident in or your favourite thing at the time. But as long as you've got an interest in it now and you're passionate about it, well, you know, we're really excited to have you on the programme. So kind of accessibility in terms of supporting people to engage with the field is, is really big for us. And again, we're really keen for um, people 
who want to learn in a multidisciplinary environment. Uh, a lot of the exercises we have are about kind of, for example, in the supervision module that I lead, it's about going off and finding out the supervision requirements in your discipline. And then you kind of present that back to the group so people hear about what supervision is like in different disciplines and you get cross pollination and insights into the field of, of kind of, of different healthcare disciplines. So we're keen to have people who have got interest in, in kind of learning from others in, in different areas. The other last thing I would say is the programme gives an opportunity to really take you on a journey. And I know it sounds really cheesy, uh, but there is an absolute opportunity to kind of challenge your perspectives and your ways of thinking if you want. And you've got time and space and bandwidth for that, which we know not everybody has when they're working hard. Um, you know, it's a real kind of the 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 kind synchronous sessions and the small group discussions are a real sort of safe space for discussion, discussion, challenging ideas. And it can it can really if you engage with it, you know, in that way, in a really open minded and curious way, you can really come out with a whole fresh perspective on what learning means and what education means in, in healthcare. So we're really excited to have students uh, on our program that are kind of open to, to going on that kind of journey. Wonderful. And I think we haven't had any other questions, but I have just one final question uh, yeah. just to um, before we end today's session. But this is just more about um, just what would you give just one piece of advice to those interested in applying for this program? Um, if you could just give them perhaps one piece, uh, that would be fantastic. Yeah, uh, I would say just think carefully when you write your personal statement um, how you're kind of getting across that education is something you're interested in and not just the practice of your actual healthcare discipline. But if I may give a second piece of advice, Kate, if that's all right. Of course, absolutely. we have time. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, absolutely. Please do reach out uh, and ask any questions. My email address is in the chat. And I think we've also got some dedicated drop-in sessions as well. So um, I'm happy to talk through uh, their application or their suitability for the programme for anyone who wants to come to a drop-in session. So, yeah, getting across your enthusiasm for education, but also reaching out for a chat if you're not sure. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Miranda. And thank you so much, everyone, for your fantastic comments and questions throughout today's session. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. And um, yeah, just to round off the event, uh, if you find that you still have any remaining questions uh, following today's event, we are also running 10 minute online one to one sessions with Miranda. Uh, that are actually taking place this Thursday between 3 and 5 p.m. So if you would like to speak to Miranda directly, you can book a slot uh, with her using a link, which I will drop into the chat now, but also you'll receive uh, the link following today's event um, in a post-event email. And um, yeah, I just want to say thank you again for all your questions and uh, um, to Miranda for such a fantastic session. And we hope that you all have a wonderful evening and please do get in touch with us. If you have any questions, we would love to hear from you. And uh, we very much hope um, you uh, wish you best of luck with your journey and applying for courses and uh, yeah, have a wonderful evening. Thanks very much. It's been lovely to see all your questions and thanks for all the positive comments in the chat too. It's, it's been really fab to, to meet you all via the webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.